I'd like to introduce Dr. Shelley Bassine, who is the chair for these clinical guidelines, and he's going to present an overview, a 10-minute overview, of the key points related to the new 2008 clinical guidelines. Dr. Bassine. Thank you, Brad. It was a real honor and privilege to uh, serve on this panel of some of the world's top experts in male reproduction. It was a long haul, nearly two and a half years in the making, but it was all very educational, collegial, and joyful, and I should hasten to add most of the time. The purpose of the guidelines is to provide a broad roadmap on how to approach the diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring of uh, hypogonadal men. The guidelines are not intended to dictate the treatment of particular patient. And we recognize that there are variations in disease manifestation, and the treatment of individual patients must be individualized based on unique circumstances of that particular patient. The process and the values. The Endocrine Society selected the expert panel and its chair. In this iteration, the Endocrine Society included a cardiologist, Hobart Hodes, primary care expert in men's health, Maria Yalamas, and a member of the European Academy of Andrology, Fred Boo. The panel worked by consensus. On most of the items, there was uh, quite a bit of agreement amongst us. There were two specific areas in which there were nuanced disagreements, the prostate monitoring recommendations and the treatment of older men. In these areas where there were some nuanced disagreements, we worked by a reconciliation process that allowed us to include statements on which we were able to agree. Items on which there were strong disagreements were not included. Evidence-based recommendations followed the great approach. In addition to the evidence, the task force considered values. We recognize that different patients and different physicians may weigh different risks and benefits differently. And therefore, in this version of the guidelines, there's much greater emphasis on shared decision-making, particularly in the decision, decision to treat and to perform prostate monitoring. We were guided by first to no harm, and so in areas where the evidence for efficacy was weak, we were guided by a stronger emphasis on safety considerations. The panel commissioned two systematic reviews and meta-analysis, one related to efficacy and one related to safety. The, this particular meta-analysis was unique in being very stringent in inclusion criteria for trials that were included. Only those randomized clinical trials were included that met the strict uh, definition of hypogonadism as established by the Endocrine Society. So only a very handful of trials, including some of the largest trials, including the T trials, were included. We focused on outcomes that were clinically relevant, patient important, and ascertained using validated instruments. And so the recent large trials of testosterone replacement therapy, including the T trials, were included. The meta-analysis was led by Juan Pablo Prito and his uh, team at Mayo Clinic. The efficacy review indicated that testosterone replacement therapy is associated with significantly greater improvements in libido, erectile function, and sex overall sexual activity more than, plus more than placebo. Testosterone is not associated with significant uh, improvements in energy or mood. There were additional benefits associated with testosterone replacement therapy in correcting unexplained as well as explained anemia 
and an improving volumetric bone density of the spine and hip. This particular meta-analysis confirmed the previous findings that testosterone replacement therapy is associated with substantially higher frequency of erythrocytosis. Additionally, the meta-analysis found no significant change in lower urinary tract symptoms in men who did not have severe lower urinary tract symptoms at baseline. In the area of diagnosis, the updated guideline reaffirmed that diagnosis should only be made in men who have symptoms and signs, plus unequivocally and consistently low total and free testosterone concentrations. The new guideline puts substantially greater emphasis on the use of accurate assays, especially LCMS MS assays for testosterone that have become more widely available since the last iteration of the guideline. Also, the updated version explicitly recommends the use of laboratories that are certified by the CDC's hormone standardization program for testosterone or another accuracy-based certifying program. We also recommend the use of harmonized reference ranges for total testosterone in CDC-certified laboratories. These reference ranges have been published recently. Also, improved understanding of testosterone's multi-step binding to SHPG, including the allosteric interaction between the two binding sites and greater availability of data on the importance of free testosterone led the panel to put greater emphasis on free testosterone determination than in the previous version of the guideline. We recommend the use of harmonized testosterone reference ranges if testosterone levels have been measured in CDC certified laboratory. In this particular effort that was supported by a grant from National Institute on Aging, as well as by the Endocrine Society's PATH program, testosterone assays from four epidemiologic studies were cross-calibrated by the CDC, and testosterone levels were then harmonized using Deming's regression. We found that the 2.5th percentile value of these harmonized levels was 264 nanograms per deciliter, and that was deemed to be the lower cutoff of the normal range. These values, that these harmonized values, can be used for testosterone assays that have been calibrated or benchmarked to the CDC's host program. Also, in the last few years, there's been increasing prevalence of androgen deficiency associated with chronic opioid use and associated with anabolic steroid withdrawal hypogonadism. In an analysis of the VA database, my colleague Gunit Jasuja found that 20% of testosterone prescriptions within the VA healthcare system were in men who were using chronic opioids. Similarly, in many men's health clinics, nearly 25 to 30% of men receiving testosterone prescriptions have a diagnosis of anabolic steroid withdrawal hypogonadism. So ascertaining history of opioid use and anabolic steroid use uh, has received greater emphasis in the diagnostic workup. Also, availability of higher quality randomized clinical trials data from several recent large trials enabled the panel to make stronger treatment recommendations for men with organic hypogonadism. But the lack of long-term randomized clinical trials data on major adverse uh, cardiovascular events and prostate cancer events led to a more guarded suggestion in older men. So the panel recommended against routinely prescribing testosterone treatment to all men 65 years or older with low testosterone concentrations. But the panel suggests that clinicians consider offering testosterone treatment on an individualized basis 
after explicit discussion of potential risks and benefits in men who are 65 years of age or older who have symptoms or conditions suggestive of testosterone deficiency such as low libido or unexplained anemia and consistently and unequivocally low morning testosterone concentrations. And in this area, the panel also emphasize, emphasizes shared decision-making in making a, a treatment decision. In the meta-analysis, erythrocytosis was again found to be the most frequent adverse event associated with testosterone treatment. There was no significant change in lower urinary tract symptom scores in men whose baseline IPSS score was less than 21. Based on literature review, the panel concluded that the trials were neither large enough nor long enough to evaluate effects on major adverse cardiovascular events and prostate cancer risk. There's no clear evidence that testosterone treatment increases the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events or prostate cancer. However, there is increased risk of prostate biopsies and increased risk of detection of subclinical prostate disease, largely due to increased surveillance and due to the testosterone-induced increase in PSA. In terms of monitoring, the panel suggested evaluating the patient at 3 to 12 months after treatment initiation and then annually to assess whether symptoms have responded and whether the patient is suffering from any adverse events. Testosterone concentrations should be monitored 3 to 6 months after initiation of testosterone therapy. And this is really important because of the very substantial variation in on-treatment testosterone levels with just about all testosterone formulations, but particularly with the transdermal formulations. Hematocrit should be checked at baseline and then three to six months after starting treatment and then annually. Bone mineral density should be measured at baseline and then after one to two years of treatment in hypogonadal men who have osteoporosis consistent with regional standards of care. The prostate monitoring guidelines witnessed some differences amongst the panelists. We recognize that both screening for uh, prostate cancer as well as monitoring is associated with some risk for the patient. And so a shared decision making whether or not to choose screening for prostate cancer and whether to monitor for prostate cancer is really important. The purpose of prostate cancer screening and monitoring is to identify those who may have prostate cancer at baseline and those who are at high risk of uh, developing prostate cancer and to minimize the risk of unnecessary prostate biopsy and detection of subclinical prostate disease. The panel suggested that for men 55 to 69 years and for men 40 to 69 years who are at increased risk for prostate cancer and who choose prostate monitoring, a digital rectal exam and PSA should be performed at baseline and then three to, six month, three to 12 months after initiating testosterone treatment and then in accordance with the guidelines for prostate cancer screening depending on the age and race of the patient. An important decision during treatment is when to refer a patient for consideration, for urologic evaluation for consideration of prostate biopsy. The panel suggests that urologic consultation is needed if there's an increase in PSA greater than 1.4 nanogram per ml within 12 months of initiating treatment. A confirmed PSA increase above 4 nanogram per ml at any time, detection of a prostate abnormality on digital rectal exam, and substantial worsening of lower urinary tract symptoms. I've covered a lot of ground, but some of these points will become more clear as we discuss the cases. Thank you.